the yoga of practice. In the Bhagavad Gita, the Lord says, He's telling Arjuna, by meditating with a mind imbued with the yoga of practice and which does not stray from anything else, one reaches that supreme person existing in the effulgent region. So the Lord uses the word Abhyasa Yoga, saying Abhyasa Yoga Yuktena, with the mind imbued with the yoga of practice. One reaches that supreme goal, that universal cosmic person known as the Purusha who resides in the divine region. This is essentially what is the yoga of practice. Okay. Even Sri Ramakrishna uses the word when a devotee asks him, oh, you know, it's so difficult to attain anything. So Sri Ramakrishna says, why? There is something called the yoga of practice, Abhyasa Yoga. And obviously, it is there. So what is this yoga of practice? We have heard of Karma Yoga, and Bhakti Yoga, and Jnana Yoga, and Laya Yoga, and Kundalini Yoga, and Vinyasa Yoga, etc., etc. So many yogas. And to cap it all off, we have another one. Which do we follow? Well, the yoga of practice is at the heart of all yogas. Without this, there is no yoga. I remember a devotee asking a monk, tell me in one word how to realize God. And the monk replied, practice. Just one word. So this is the way. So people want you know, to have these fast or quick realization. In yoga, you don't have anything quick realization. So practice, the Sanskrit word, as I said, is abhyasa. It is repetitive actions. It is also something you go towards. You go something towards what you want to be, what you want to attain. Essentially, it's what you want to be. You approach that. And that is called practice, abhyasa. So, constantly there has to be an action. And if you study your own lives, you will see that you have attained what you, what you have attained through practice. Nothing else. You have worked hard for it and you've got it. You could have worked harder. You could have got something better. That is essentially what is practice. Now, it has to be distinguished between Obsessive compulsive disorder. There also you find is repeated practice, repeated behavior. But these are compulsions moved by fear or anxiety. Or there is a part of the brain that makes you obsessive. And then it leads to compulsive behavior. I think many of you have seen all these things. But uh, some of us, we do the same thing. I think we have I've forgotten to lock the door. I come back, I lock it, I go. I'm still doubting. I come back again, lock the door. So there are these people who are caught in the grip of those repetitive actions. But those are compulsions. 
they are compelled to do these things. While in proper yoga practice or any practice, it's a very deliberate, conscious act that one is doing. So just to make a kind of a distinction between the two. Now in these days of fast food and fast cars and fast, and there's something called the fast yoga also. Uh, fast yoga. I wish they would have done fasting for the yoga. That would have given them a better chance for yoga. But all these fancy names for these new yogas are just fancies if there is no practice behind them. So this is what we are going to talk about. We are already talking about it. When Swami Turiyananda, he saw Swami Vivekananda before he could come to the West, he saw him and, he, and the first thing he said, he was perfected. That is, he had practiced long and he had attained perfection. So, perfection it is attained through practice. As we know, practice makes perfect. There is there's no doubt about it. So, if you have adequate practice, you have perfection there with you. It also depends on the person, the subject. It also depends on sometimes circumstances. But if you can put your heart and soul into it, then circumstances give way to this will. So it is an exertion of will. It is a manifestation of power. It is a power of one's personality. And practice makes one's character. Nothing else. It is work, work, work. So when thoughts flow through the mind, they are just thoughts. Sometimes they are good thoughts and sometimes they are bad thoughts. When you speak, those thoughts become a little more real. And when you put them into action, they become even more real. And if you put them into repeated actions, they become more real. So we all have heard about God. Yes, we have God. And sometimes it just passes through our mind and goes away. Sometimes you speak about God and yeah. The more you speak, the more, yeah, now God is the reality. We'll keep on saying it's not something, it's like, it's not a kind of fancy, it's not nothing. So when you put this into practice, then it becomes more and more. So the question is, how do you know that you know that there is a God? It is through making your thoughts more and more real. The thoughts about God, thoughts about divinity, thoughts about the self becomes more and more real. So you are doing something that is real. You are just thinking about it and then letting it pass. So you are acting on that particular thought. Okay. Okay. So we have <coughs> Sri Ramakrishna, but you know, practice, practice, practice is so dry. It's extremely dry and everybody feels it, but actually no. As you keep on practicing, there is what Sri Ramakrishna says, the bhajanananda, the joy of worship, the joy of practice. As you practice, there is a development of power within you and there is a joy accompanying that. So you can go for days and days with a certain practice by keeping the goal in view and you will get a joy. So practice is not dry, it may appear dry, but the person, the subject is deriving that joy. So that is the joy of practice, it is not a dry feeling. So as I said, practice is a conscious, deliberate, you can say act of the will. It is putting your entire personality into that. 
Yeah, there are some people who will kind of practice without putting their faith in it. I do not know whether I am going to get it. So, that lack of faith is the lack of understanding oneself and understanding the goal also. So, there are these conscious and subconscious layers of the mind that work in tandem to bring about the results. There is a saying that if you practice anything for 10,000 hours, your brain has completely changes. I mean, you, it changes every time you do something. You rewire the brain because the brain is plastic. And for, for mastery, they say 10,000 hours. Wow, it will take your whole lifetime 10,000 hours. Imagine doing something. It's, it's a daily thing over and over and over and over. So 10,000 hours is the magic number. Do something for 10,000 hours. But then there comes yoga. It says, oh, if you have faith in that and if you put your energy into that, you can reduce the 10,000 hours because you are changing the neurons. You are making certain neurons stronger, the connection between them is stronger and the others making, are making, are doing them weak. So, strengthening, you are changing your body and you are changing your brain with every act of practice that you do over and over again. So, it also brings into focus your body, your senses, your mind, your intellect, and of course, your sense of self also. Sri Ramakrishna gives a lot of uh, many examples. A person is fishing and uh, he is seeing the, the float quivering and the fish is biting at the bait and the person is sweating. And uh, another person comes and saying, where is that? He asks for an address. So, this person is so concentrated there, he does not hear that person. And then the fish bites and then he hooks the fish and pulls it out of the water. Then he wipes his sweat and then he calls out to that person who was impatient. He leaves it saying, what were you saying? I, I repeated my question a couple of times. You never heard it. Yeah, but the, during that time, I was concentrated there. Now tell me what is your question? So, at that moment of practice, this is the way to pour yourself into that practice. Then you do not need to wait for 10,000 hours. You can do it quickly. Okay. Like anything that is attained in the world is this. So, Swamiji gives an example of uh, a girl playing the piano and she is playing, she is consciously and deliberately pressing each key looking at the key and pressing. And after months and months of practice, she can sing or she can even talk while she practice. What has happened is, the conscious actions get submerged and go in the subconscious. And then again it rises and becomes conscious. So, there is a loop that is created in the mind, conscious, subconscious, again conscious. Sub so, all our actions especially practice is a combination of both the conscious and the subconscious mind. And so, the entire mind is engaged in that act the practice. So, everything that you have done, everything that you have said, everything you have worked for, everything has become subconscious and it makes sense. It saves a, it saves a lot of energy and this is a very high intensive organ, the brain it uses 15 percent of all your energy needs. So, it has to save a lot of energy and it does it by making things subconscious. So, it saves itself that way. So, anything done repeatedly over and over again 
it becomes part of you, the subconscious part of you. I say subconscious because you might say, oh, it's subconscious, it's not coming. No, no, it is there, it's alive, it is living. The subconscious mind is a very living entity there within and it is deep. It's just that we are not aware of it and that's why we call it a subconscious mind. So the entire subconscious mind is transformed to practice. And the conscious mind, of course, is more or less a slave of the subconscious mind. So now this yoga practice. Right? Now yoga, as we know, is difficult. And practice also is difficult. Now you've got to combine two difficult things together. You're asking for too much. So Arjuna says, oh my God, this yoga that you have spoken about, it's very difficult to attain. Why? Because the restlessness of the mind. And I feel it's like trying to subdue the wind. It is as difficult to subdue the mind. And the Lord says, you know, smiles and says, yeah, yeah, it's difficult, eh? but it can be done with practice and detachment. So when one practices, one sees that you've got to sacrifice so many things for your practice. Oh yeah, that's inevitable. Suppose you want to do something or be something, rather it's going to be something. You've got to neglect or sacrifice many other things. Oh, I would like to go for a party. No, but I'd rather study here. That's better. So you've got to sacrifice one thing. And you'll find you're sacrificing many things. This is detachment. So it's a natural consequence of practice. It's, uh, it's spoken of as two things, but if you do one thing correctly, practice, you get the other thing automatically. So the Lord says, practice and detachment. It can be controlled, it can be made, it can be harnessed through practice and detachment. So these are the famous verses in the sixth chapter when, when he's teaching the yoga of, you can say, meditation to Arjuna. So it is doubtless, you see the nature of the mind is to be constantly active. Even in deep sleep, it is active. But you don't know. In dream sleep, we know it is always active. So in deep sleep, there is a wave that runs across the mind. In case the wave does not run across the mind, you are not aware of it, of course. The mind will simply disintegrate. So it has to have some form of activity in the waking state, in the dream state, and even in the deep sleep state. It's always there. So the mind functions on waves, it rises and falls and rises and falls. You must be able to catch that wave, not in deep sleep, in the waking state, of course, and use that. So practice is not always like in a flat, straight line. It always runs into waves. So sometimes you are going to push hard and hard and hard and hard. And then you crash that wave and then you, then practice becomes a little more easy. It rolls down. And as it rolls down, it also carries that person a little higher on the next wave. And then again you push. And then. So the nature of the mind itself will start cooperating with you as you keep on practicing. This is, uh, I mean, once you understand the dynamics of the practice, as you keep on practicing, subjectively you know you are doing this, you can use the energies of the mind to focus more and more and more and more. That is, so this is how practice works. If this is okay, then I think uh, we can understand. Even Patanjali in his yoga aphorism says that practice and 
detachment. Abhyasa vairagya bhyam tan niroda is controlled through practice and detachment. And then he says, what is practice? He's saying constant effort to keep the waves of the mind still is practice. Saying tatra yatno sthito abhyasa. So constantly to keep it steady is practice. So we get the idea that this is the very heart of what Patanjali says, Sampragnata Yoga, the yoga where you can get tremendous knowledge. So with practice as the mind has become still, I mean the other waves of the mind have become still and the practice is flowing with the waves, the rise and the crash, you know, rise and the crash, flowing. At that point, the mind becomes still. And when the mind becomes still, all the knowledge of the universe flows into you. The knowledge of the universe does not flow into you because the water is choppy, too choppy. So to quell the waves, other waves, and to make the mind into one form of practice is called the yoga of practice. Okay. So we can proceed a little more. So Patanjali also says, instead of saying 10,000 hours, he says, success is speedy for the extremely energetic. Oh, so yeah, we know what it is. So success in anything is quick for the extremely energetic. So, if you put something in a kind of a routine, that becomes natural to you. And that is what Patanjali is talking about. And then, of course, you got to speed up. You got a desire to know the truth or to see God, whatever you like to know, see. You need to become extremely energetic. So, as you practice, time is compressed. You notice when you are engaged, you don't realize how time has flown. And when you are not doing anything, you see, you keep on looking at that watch. I have 10 minutes more. So the time depends on your state of mind. There it is. So this 10,000, yeah, it can be taken just to kind of dissuade the faint hearted but those who are not faint hearted can give be given that, yeah, this is how much you got to do. <gasps> oh my God. No. <laughs> I remember when I was young. So I was saying, so we were talking, and after Vespers, you know, after Vespers in India, we sit down and have tea and, and we chat along with the monks and all. And then he's saying, so I, I was young and I was saying, so you have to excuse me, I'm, I'm going to practice meditation. Hey, you come, sit down here, he say. He's a senior. You sit down, come, quiet here. So I was hesitant and sit down here. You have the whole night to meditate. You come and sit down here now. And then he says, we practice, especially yogis. You make your day and night into one. So that was a lesson I had learned. That is, oh, it's night, it's time to sleep, it's time to eat, time to this. Forget all these things. If you want, you will set your heart on that particular thing. Your day is as good as night and the night is as good as the day. Make your day and night into one. Forget your circadian rhythms and this and that. So that was a big eye opener for me. So yeah, so I still remember <laughs> that monk scolding me for that. <laughs> so of course, so there are different classes of aspirants, the lowest, the middling and the extremely energetic, the uttama. 
So, it depends on how much time and energy you can. You give anything time and it comes in to you. You can grasp it. It's just that giving time to, if, suppose you want to study uh, calculus, what do you do? You first read it and you don't know anything about calculus. Oh, guy must be crazy, wrote all these things. And if you read it in the, the Indian way, the old Indian style, it is even more difficult. But read it one time, two times, three times, four times, slowly and slowly and slowly, you will start getting a grip on this. That is what you need to have. This is nothing but what? It's nothing but practice. Repeated practice over and over and over. Oh, you know, Japa is so difficult. Really, you, did you try it? I tried it for one day. So, I remember a young man used to come and meet me and saying, saying, how to control the mind. So, I told, I gave him a book. I said, buy that book, Mind and Its Control. So, he was very pleased. And it was, I think it was like 5 rupees there, like 5 dollars. Oh, so cheap. Yeah. After a couple of days, he's saying, I've read that book. My mind is not controlled. I said, that won't do. <laughs> You've got to put something into practice. So, people say, Japa, it's so difficult. You give it some time. Put it in, uh, into practice and then you'll see. Like Sri Ramakrishna says, there is something called the bhajanananda, the joy of practice. I remember one monk, of course now he is the vice president. Uh, he was telling us about his guru. So he was, uh, Swami, that Swami has come to Seattle. So he is telling me about his guru. He was supposed to serve him. And uh, it was evening and he just slowly peeped in to see what Maharaj was doing. So, if he calls him, he will be ready. So, he just peeps through the window and he sees his guru doing japa. And, you know, we for us, we, we have a, a sad face, a face that is full of anxiety and it's grimacing, my back is aching, my leg has gone numb and when this, this, this thing will get over. Oh. When he saw his guru, his face was beaming with joy and he was as it was swaying as he was doing his chapa, he was full of joy. Saying that imprinted itself so deeply in my mind. And that has been with me. And he was telling us, he was one of our teachers also. And, and that is what it is. This comes after practice. There's a tremendous sense of joy has come in. And that practice has attained its fulfillment. This is what is practice. Okay. You will not get anything without practice. Sorry. People wait for lotteries. There is no lottery here in the yoga of practice. So, there are two, the comment, commentators on the yoga sutras talks about the two methods of practice. One is the violent and one is the wise. The violent one is go whole, you can say throttle, full throttle as they say. And that person will spend it himself or herself, kind of fizzled out, burns out, burns out cases. You have many burnt out yogis and, you know, plenty. You'll find uh, after a few years and they give it up, right? Ah. So, their upaya, their methodology was wrong. The wise is to understand the structures of the mind, to have a perfectly philosophical view of what you are going to attain. People will say, people want to attain something which they are not even sure of. It's not clear in their mind. So, you have to philosophically 
get yourself established in that idea. This is what I want to attain, this is the means and then go about it slowly, step by step by step by step. That is the method. So, you go. So, these two methods, we, we have got to take the wise method slowly. Shankaracharya also says, you know, uh, in the evenings when the cows had to be brought back to the cow shed, you know, they are out in the fields. So, if you take a stick and run behind the cows and try to drive them back, they will also run, run about. So, that is not the way, way. The other way is take a long, nice, fresh sheaf of grass and kind of take it out there and attract them and then slowly walk towards the cows and then the cows will all follow you. This is the wise method. Okay. So, it has to be done without violence, it has to be done with understanding. Okay. Swamiji says, do not speak too much, do not speak, do not be like me, I speak too much at times. <laughs> Speaking disturbs the mind. Then he also says, do not mix around with all sorts of people because that distracts the mind. When you are in the mode of yoga of practice, automatically the, your, your practice itself will keep you away from all sorts of people and all sorts of nonsense. You will check yourself always. Oh, I said what I said, uh, what I did was kind of stupid. Okay. So, Swamiji also says that, okay, saying, say, saying, have that sort of determination. I will quote him to succeed, one must have tremendous perseverance, tremendous will. I will drink the ocean says the persevering soul, at my will, mountains will crumble. Have that sort of energy, that sort of will, work hard and you will reach the goal. This is the correct attitude for you to have when you are practicing. Nothing is going to stop me because I am unstoppable. The other method is you have to now slowly think of yourself as something higher than what you normally think of yourself. Because you see, we have one conception of ourselves that people see us. There is another conception of ourselves from the subjective side. People may think like this, but I am actually like this. I have a different idea about myself subjectively. So, these two things are always diametrically opposite each other. What people think of you is maybe partially true, but partially incorrect also. So, there is a subjective side of you that you know yourself, but there is also another part of you that is your ideal self, that, that self that you aspire to be. That is the ideal self of yours. You must hold on to that ideal self of yours and practice. Not that objective information that you have about you or the subject in ideas about you. Have that idealized view of yourself that I am this. It is more like an elevated feeling of yourself. And then you practice. Then your practice becomes very firm. Otherwise, you are going to have pushing and pulling. Uh, it will become a pain. Of course, they say no pain, no gain. You heard of this? Uh, that is what it is. The scriptures talk about in, in a kind of a, diff, in, gives you an illustration. The mind has got two directions of flow. So, if it flows towards the good, it rises towards the high ground of liberation and it flows towards bad, it goes down into again reincarnations. 
So it's got, it's, you know, it's a lot. Mano nama nadhyat ubhayoyata vahini. So the, the, the river of the mind has two movements, up and down. Up and down. Most of us are going up little and going down more. Now again we tried. So when uh, we were in Belur Mat, you know, we used to say, hey, there's a high tide coming. We, we lived far away from the, you know, big rivers. So in the, even in the gospel you find the high tide coming and everybody goes to see the high tide. So the water rises you know, in the Ganga. Why? Because there is a high tide there in the ocean, Bay of Bengal. So it pushes all the water, that is a high tide. And the water actually runs the opposite side, the way it was flowing, it runs back. And then when uh, again there is a low tide, the water runs back to the ocean, sea. So we used to see this in the river Ganga, water flowing both sides, high tide, low tide. Right? You will see, you will find it in the, mentioned in the gospel also, Sri Ramakrishna, come, come, come quickly, there is the high tide coming. And he used to run and everybody is there trying to dress up and all, hey, you fools fellow, you should have come the way it was. It, it, and see, see the boats rocking with that, the waves. So the mind actually works like this. Sometimes it runs like this side and sometimes it's this side. Uh, we used to make, uh, while we are studying these scriptures, then we're saying, yeah, those, those guys must be living in places where they had these high and low tides in the river, not in the ocean. So this is, it flows towards good and rises above on the plane of discernment and then goes towards, it's called a pragbhara. It goes towards the high ground of liberation. And the other, otherwise it will flow down because the nature of the mind is to flow down. Holy Mother says, yeah, my child, the nature of the mind is to flow down. It always but then, if you have the sun of knowledge, the water is sucked up. So that's what it is. Keep an idealized view of yourself or keep focusing on your chosen ideal or your object of meditation and the mind rises up again. This is a very simple. You know. So this is, so do we receive help? Yes, and Sri Ramakrishna says, God helps one whom he sincerely sees struggling. Yeah, it is his words. So, and in many cases uh, saying, even if you have taken the wrong path, somebody will come and say, no, no, actually, this is not the path to Puri. This is the way you go. Here you go that day. Somebody is really there to help you. And he also says that, you know, when you, you have practicing. You take one step towards God, God takes ten steps towards you. So, so this is your hope. When you practice, you are not alone. Generally, when you are practicing, we feel alone, you know, and you need to be alone. You, do, you cannot practice in a big group. You can, in a way, if you are doing the same activity. But in you know, practicing, practicing alone. But Always have the feeling, I am not alone. I am always being looked after. My every effort is being recorded as it were. Not only in my subconscious mind, but also in God's presence. This is how you keep on practicing, practicing. And you know, Raja Maharaj, one time there was a young man who was supposed to leave Belur Mat, that is to be posted far away. I think it was, he was supposed to go to Madras and he didn't want to go. Saying, if you don't, I will give you a great mantra, Maha Mantra, before leaving. Say, okay, okay. And he got himself ready and he was ready to go and on the day he was leaving, he goes to Rajamar, 
what about that maha mantra the great mantra you said so he, he pulled him in his ear he said practice 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 this is your great mantra this is what the whole thing is practice 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 okay he also says this raja maharaj says believe me the lord is always with you if you practice a little god will extend his helping hand to you it is god who is protecting us from all miseries and troubles how unbounded his grace is how can i describe it to you this is from the eternal companion now when you understand this oh, i am not alone <laughs> i being cared for this is why what is now after all this we still say but what do i have to go through that grind terrible grind yeah the lord says the knowledge is superior to practice ah then i will go there are many people who don't want to have that kind of practice practice they will become like gyana yogis the world is an illusion why should i practice hmm yeah if the world is an illusion your practice also is an illusion why should i do that illusory thing that's a nice clever argument but the lord says knowledge is superior to practice and meditation is superior to knowledge because the the knowledge that you receive in meditation is of a different category that they want to knowledge is superior to practice yeah then he says it is meditation and then he says then the lord says <laughs> as compared to meditation the renunciation of all fruits of action is even superior can you do that you, okay you don't want to practice you don't want to meditate all right and you have so much knowledge also so then do this renunciation of all fruits of actions and the lord says that this is called mad yoga that is my yoga the lord's yoga so practice of actions if you don't want to do it whatever you do try to renounce whatever fruits of actions that you do simple as that and the lord says this is my yoga the lord's yoga it's a divine yoga so if you can do that good enough the, the, the verse is shreyo hi gyanam abhyasa gyana dhyanam vishishyate dhyanat karma phala tyaga tyaga shanti ranand from there you will get eternal peace as clear as that you want eternal peace yeah you don't want to practice no you don't want to meditate no i don't have the time you know i'm a busy person okay whatever you do just offer all the fruits of all your actions to god don't try to keep something like behind okay i say i'll give 50% to god and i'll give 50% to me no no give it 100% so the renunciation of actions then the lord also is merciful you know he knows how many guys will practice and how many guys will not practice so this is the best means to attain god okay om shanti 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 hi hari hi om tat sat shri ram krishna arpanamastu